because I think this image uh, is very accurate in showing a kind of, this is an incorrect understanding of knowledge. Okay? And yet, this is kind of how we operate our schools. Even right now, right? Here's Damon. I'm talking to you. I'm in front of you. I'm trying to give you information. I'm trying to give you knowledge. Complete sudegi. Garbage. Alright? <laughs> Is that our, edu our whole, our educational system, our educational instruction system actually does not match, does not match our understanding of physics, does not match our understanding of biology, okay, and certainly definitely does not understand our, our contemporary understanding of cognition. Okay, it's particularly social, social cognition, okay? We are alive, yes? Yes. Okay, we are alive, okay? And yet our educational system never thinks about this, never thinks about how we are alive and what that might mean for education, okay? We have a system that is rooted in this, this old style, this old style of transferring knowledge. Okay, what this is, is that this largely relies on a belief that in our DNA, in our DNA, we have smart people. He has high IQ. She has high IQ. He has low IQ. She has low IQ. Okay, and that somehow your DNA, your genes, relate to your intelligence and decide or determine your intelligence, and then it decides or determines your ability to learn. This is, again, complete sudden. <laughs> complete garbage. Okay, the idea that even like the, that this results in our parts of our brains being good at learning or something like that, okay? It's called dualism. I won't, we won't get it, I won't. I'm going to keep this uh, simple today, I think. Okay. And here's just one, one example. This is uh, 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 Eleanor McGuire. She won the Nobel Prize, actually, for this research. Um, is that we find that external factors, things that are outside of our body, things that are outside of our body affect our cognitive development, particularly our brain. Okay, so for example, what this is, is this is research done on taxi drivers in London. One of the things that they found was that these taxi drivers in London actually have a part of the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is inside your brain, and it's connected with your, your spatial orientation, your ability to understand spatial orientation. Okay, and one thing that they found was that taxi drivers in London have larger hippocampus. But not just that taxi drivers have larger hippocampus, but actually that the time, your time spent as a taxi driver, your hippocampus actually increases. Your ability, your socio, or I'm sorry, spatial, your spatial cognitive ability that is connected with your hippocampus grows over time the longer you are a taxi driver. It shows us that this is not in your genes. It's not in your DNA. It's that this cognitive ability is outside of you, connected to your environment. Okay, so we're now going to try to accommodate for things, for our cognitive abilities that are outside of us. I'll try to lay a, a framework for that. Okay, and, and we need to do this uh, for ed educationally speaking. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three fields. We're going to look at what's called biophysics, biophysics, biology and physics together, similar to biochemistry. Um, and we're also going to look at what's called uh, sociocultural evolution, and we're also going to look at anthropology. Hopefully you guys know what these mean. Okay. So, we're going to start with the biophysical framework. This is that, again, we are alive. What is your body? What is your body made of? DNA. Uh, yeah, but what's even DNA made of? It's primarily, our bodies are made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus.
phosphorus, calcium, I don't know, something else, some other things. About most all of our bodies. Now, how is it, how is it that we can be made of carbon, hydrogen, calcium, phosphorus, well, potassium, potassium, these things, and we are alive. Not only are we alive, but we have cognitive abilities. Actually, I shouldn't just point at that. We have a mind. Okay? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take us from, hey, we need to understand chemistry. We need to understand biology. We need to understand physics for us to understand the mind, for us to understand learning, for us to understand education. Okay? And what I'm going to advocate for here is what's called physically grounded knowledge. Okay? If I say, for example, reach, reach, everyone understands reach? No. Okay. How about hand? If I say the word son, everyone understands the word son? Everyone? Yes? How can you understand the word son? How can you understand that? Is that it's not in your brain. I mean, it is. Your, your brain is very important. But it's not in your brain. Your DNA is very important, but it's not in your DNA. It's that you have a hand. You have a hand. You need a hand to be able to understand a hand. For if I say the word reach, to be able to understand the word reach, you have to have that physical ability. Is that your physical body is very connected to your knowledge. Your physical body is very connected to your knowledge. All knowledge. All of your knowledge comes from basically the physical body or interactions between uh, your physical body with other physical bodies uh, within world, okay? Uh, I won't go into this right now. We're starting very, very, very simple. Close your cell phones, okay? We're starting very simple. Clustering. Does it, do you know the word clustering? Cluster. Hanguka. Cluster. Ladder. Ladder. Chippa. Okay? A cluster. For example, we have clustering here. Although this is a very smooth transition clustering. What's your name? I forgot your name. What's your name? Julian? Julian, can you see blue on the screen here? Yes? Can you see yellow? Okay. The fact that she can see blue and see yellow means that there must be clustering. If there is no clustering, you can't understand or see anything. Now, here's a question. Everyone, everyone can see blue. Can you see pink? Okay. What is this? Is this blue or pink? Okay. What color is this? How about this? Okay, so clustering, clustering is real. In fact, there are clusters inside your retina, inside your retina, inside your eye, that allow you to, for the light to reflect off of here and onto here. There are clusters that they that then are transferred into your brain. It's all clusters, okay, connections of clusters. And yet, at the same time, though, where something starts and where something stops is not clear. It's not black and white. Okay? Not black and white. It is real because we see blue. We see green. We see yellow. We see purple. We see pink. That is clustering. 
but where it starts and where it stops is very difficult. Now, what this means here is that for something to have meaning, for something to have meaning, okay, it must be separate from everything else. For example, a gesture, okay, that's nothing, but a gesture, now that has meaning, okay, is that it has to be a clustering. A clustering can be a clustering of actions, okay, that then is able to take on meaning, or, but it can't just be random, okay, it can't be random. What this means is that there are forces, real forces, physical forces that are affecting meaning, the construction, the, the categorization of meaning. Okay? Hold on a second. Okay? There are forces there. What kind of forces are deciding the meaning here? What kind of forces? Hands. Arms, past history, social, cultural history are going on here. The emotions, the emotions that we get when we smile, we give high five. Okay? There are lots of things, there are lots of patterns that, that cluster to give us meaning. Okay? This is, a, for example, uh, we're looking at just the way that muscles. The ways that muscles form are affected by our genes, are affected by proteins and enzymes, are affected by metabolic metabolism processes, are affected by our endocrine, which is hormones, affected by our neural system, affected by our social network. The formation of muscles is affected by our social network, affected by gravity, Affected by a magnetic field. Affected by, here this is, um, uh, it's called hydrophilia, hydrophobia, which is for molecules. Molecules are attracted or repelled from water. The physical, the physical condition of attraction or repulsion from water, all of these things are working at the same time to affect the ways that our muscles form. Okay, so we have many constraints that are working to create a cluster, a cluster maybe of muscles. Now, these things are not easy, like I said, are not easy to know where it starts and where it stops. For example, here we've got some typhoons, okay, now, this typhoon, can you see the typhoon? Yes. Okay, so it is real. Typhoons are real. Now, this typhoon, is this always the same or constantly changing? Constantly changing. All the time, from every second, it is changing. And yet, I say, is this a typhoon? You say yes. Same with our body. Our body is constantly changing. Your skin, you lose all of your skin every 22 days. Every 22 days, your skin, completely different. Your spleen, every 48 hours, all the cells in your spleen, completely new. Okay? And yet, at the same time, you think, oh, I am in young. Ah, I am Gio. Hi, I'm Damien. But we are constantly changing. Okay, so we are constantly undergoing a process of change that is very difficult to know where it starts and where it stops. For example, let's see here. This right here, is this part of this typhoon or is this part of this typhoon? This right here, these, these clouds, these clouds right here, are these clouds part of this typhoon or part of this typhoon? My point here is it's very difficult for us to know where something is, where it starts, where it stops, and it's always changing.
But, but we know it is a type error. It has enough structure, enough structure that we are able to identify it, that the clustering is, is consistent enough. And here's a big problem though, is that this, okay, this is a cluster, okay, a cluster of energy, okay, a cluster of energy, cluster of clouds, this is clustering. What is clustering, Haruka? Cluster? This is a cluster. Now here's one of the things about our brains and our cognitive inside of our, 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 our the ways that our brains work is that these clusters are not just not just in one area. So for example, these patterns of clustering can be in different areas but connected. For example, this is some research that's showing how music and emotions, which are very connected to our hormones, like testosterone, progesterone, I don't know, what are some other, other hormones? Estrogen. Say again? Progesterone. Okay, progesterone, yeah. How these are actually connected to music. So, for example, here, this is an auditory region of the brain, is that when we are hearing music, it also stimulates emotion-centered regions of the brain. So these clusters, a cluster is not just in one area. A cluster can be connected over different areas in the brain. This is what's known as structural coupling. For example, a great example of structural coupling is our ability to make speech and our ability to hear. They are both connected. You cannot make speech without hearing, or you can, you can, because you can uh, couple it with other, other systems. Okay, we can, but but they are connected anyways. They're, it's what we call structurally coupled together. Okay? For example, we find that a lot of neural signals, synapse, will fall into similar patterns. Okay? And when they stay in similar patterns for a long enough period of time, they become connected together. Structurally coupled. Uh, I just talked about our auditory, uh, we might have our auditory and lower systems. I was just talking about that with sound. Hearing. For example, our circulatory system and nervous system. For example, do does your brain does your brain need your heart? No. Yeah. No heart, no blood going to your brain, no oxygen going to your brain. No brain. You need a heart. Does your heart need a brain? Absolutely, because your cerebellum creates signals that tells your heart to go your whole life. These two things are connected together. They are structurally coupled. You cannot separate them. Okay? Uh, for example, we've also found in, for example, Megadose fly, which is in uh, Africa, and uh, a group of geraniums, about four species of geraniums is that there's only one, one kind of, well, there are one group, there's 12, 12 of them, of these kinds of flies, that can pollinate these flowers. If this, fl if this fly disappears, the flower disappears also. If the flower disappears, the fly disappears. Clownfish and sea anemones. The clownfish, needs the sea anemone for protection from other fish. The sea anemone needs the clownfish because the clownfish cleans it, eats bacteria, little small organisms, and then poops. Okay, it gives that, that gives uh, nutrition. Okay, this is called structural coupling, is that we can have things that are very different become connected together. This is a kind of clustering, in a way. 
I'll make this, this, this is connected to language and learning, trust me. Okay? And what this, is, what this reflects is that for us to understand knowledge or language, for us to understand knowledge or language, you have to understand that it is different systems in the brain. It's not one system. It's many systems working together. Hand. You know the word hand. You know the word hand. Okay, knowledge. Hand. Reach. You understand? Reach. It is connected to your body. There are multiple systems. When I reach, I'm using my visual system. Okay, which is part of your visual cortex, which is right back here. In co coordination with my motor, my motor cortex, which is in this region. Which, when I then say hand or reach, is connected with my vocal system, which is connected with my hearing system. All of these things are connected together in action. Action. For us to understand knowledge, Knowledge is connected to action. Please understand that. Think about what this means for school. For you to know, for you to understand something, there must be a physical body with physical action. This is, just so you know, this is a big change going on right now in cognitive science. Okay, it's what we call, it's, we're moving towards what's called an inactive, pragmatic paradigm, or an action-oriented paradigm. Action, you need action for knowledge. Action is required for knowledge. Think about how that is connected 